first uh, presenter. So, okay, if everyone has a seat. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Sven Oskarsson and I'm a political scientist from Uppsala University, Sweden. And the paper I'm going to talk about today of genes and screens is joint work together with Jonathan Bouchamp, uh, Isa Okbey and also Kevin Tom. So we have two main aims or uh, objectives for this study. First of all, on the more substantive side, we want to study potential heterogeneous effects of a Swedish educational reform implemented in the 1950s. And our contribution to this particular literature is that we use a polygenic score of educational attainment as a new and hopefully better measure of uh, ability. Second of all, second of all also, uh, we uh, hope that we also can contribute to the co uh, growing literature on estimation of G by E effects. And here, more precisely, we argue that the reform in focus here provides plausibly exogenous variation in educational uh, entertainment. So I guess not uh, that uh, very few of you are familiar with this particular Swedish reform, so I will spend a little bit of time on, on, on uh, going through it and so, so we can set this study into context. So there are two main features of this school reform. First of all, it lengthened compulsory schooling from seven to nine years. And second of all, it postponed tracking. So in the pre-reform system, the more able students were selected into the theoretically oriented junior high school at age 11, whereas the less able students remained in the basic school until they completed the seventh grade. Uh, now that means that in the post-reform system, uh, all students were kept in the same classes and in the same schools uh, until they completed the ninth grade, the new minimum level of schooling. And another very useful property of this reform is the way it was implemented. The reform was rolled out gradually over the country uh, between 1949 and 1962 uh, as a part of a larger evaluation program. So in municipalities that took part in this uh, evaluation program, pupils between uh, grade one and grade five were assigned to the new school system, whereas those in grades six and seven stayed in the old system. So this means that for a prolonged period of time, we had a system or a situation where student, students born in the same year, but living in different municipalities, were assigned to different school systems. And at the same time, we had students living in the same municipality, but very close in age, were also assigned to different school systems. So uh, this feature enabled us to use a, a difference in different strategy to provide more plausible causal estimates of the reform and different outcomes. Now, however, we are not the first one to exploit these features of this reform. So the first or, or the seminal study is a paper by Costas McGee and, and, and Morten Palme, uh, published in American Economic Review in 2005. And in this paper, they show that the reform had positive and significant impacts on both education and income, especially for low ability females from less advantaged socioeconomic backgrounds. And this is also the paper that is most closely related to our study here. And subsequent studies have also shown that uh, the reform has significant impacts on a number of outcomes, such as health outcomes, criminal behavior, political inequality, and so on and so on. Uh, the theoretical departure point of this paper is two broad or general hypotheses. The first one, the human capital hypothesis, uh, according to this one, we should uh, expect that the reform mainly will affect low ability individuals whose behavior is directly impacted by the reform. And the underlying assumption here is that the effect of education on wages reflects increased productivity. Another way to state this or think about this is that we should not expect the reform to have any uh, impact on wages in equilibrium. Under this kind of situation, there is no real reason for a utility maximizing individual to obtain more education unless, unless he or she is forced to do so uh, as a consequence of the reform. So what will happen is that, is that the reform will compress the, the education distribution, especially at the lower, uh, lower end of the uh, distribution, by forcing low ability students to complete more schooling. The signaling or sorting hypothesis then 
Uh, according to this one, we should expect the reform to have to also have ripple effects at higher levels in the ability distribution. And the underlying assumption here is that uh, the effect of education on wages at least partly reflects innate ability. So this means that we assume that individuals or workers use education to signal their unobservable ability. And at the same time, we, we assume that employers use education to screen for workers. So in a situation now where, where a compulsory schooling reform has forced lower ability uh, individuals to get more schooling, some of the higher ability uh, students will be incentivized to get even more schooling in order to distance themselves from the lower ability individuals. So thinking about this in, in that way, we have indirect effects of the reform. It will impact individuals not directly constrained by the reform, sort of ripple effects of the reform. Uh, this slide pretty much just summarizes what I just said. So, so we have slightly different empirical uh, implications of these two hypotheses. So for both of them, we should expect the reform to affect, uh, the reform effect to decrease as a function of mobility uh, at the lower end of the education distribution. And for the signal hypothesis, we should also expect the reform effect to increase as a function of mobility at higher levels of the uh, uh, e education distribution. Does the mic work? Or do I need to speak up? Yes. So, so, can we get the mic to work? No. Anyway, I can, I can speak loud. So, so uh, to test this hypothesis, we use data from the Swedish children. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and, and the sample consists of genotype individuals born between 1943 and 1945. And the final sample size, after some sample descriptions, amounts to almost 6,000 individuals. And we have registered data to, to measure education as per people and also income on eight different occasions between 1970 and 2005. And we also use the census from 1970. To infer the municipality of residence of uh, the individuals when they were at school age. As our measure of ability, we use a polygenic score of uh, education attainment uh, based on the results um, reported in the Occupy et al. study uh, published in Nature last year. And uh, the the score weights are based on a GWA sample uh, with a size of almost 400,000 individuals, excluding, of course, the Swedish individuals here. And the score is constructed using almost 1.2 million SNPs, without any p-value threshold restrictions here. And the incremental R-square of this score is 6.2%. Now on the next slide, we have some simple summary statistics for this twin sample. And to check the representativeness of this sample, I've also included some population statistics for the corresponding cohorts born between 1943 and 1955. And the first thing, the thing we can see here is that slightly more than a third of uh, the twin sample were affected, the individuals in, in the sample were affected by the reform. This is somewhat less than the population average, and this is due to the fact that the twin sample is slightly older than the uh, population average, uh, about half a year. We can also see that the males in the twin sample fare somewhat better than the population average when it comes to education, income, and, and cognitive performance. Uh, but the differences here are pretty small. And the females in, in the twin sample, they are very similar to the population average, uh, as for schooling and yearly income. Now then, I've already mentioned that we will employ a difference in different strategy to, to estimate the impact, of the, the impact of this reform. So we can first have a look at here at equation one, which is uh, an additive model. And the R sub CM here is a dummy indicating, indicating whether an individual uh, from cohort C living in municipality M well, was affected by the reform or not. And S sub ICM is just a polygenic score. Here it's standardized with a mean zero and standard deviation equal to one. 
C is a vector control variables, and above all, we include fixed effects for birth cohort and also for a set of municipality clusters. And these municipality clusters are defined by grouping together all municipalities that implemented the reform the same year, which means that we have 14 municipality clusters, one for each implementation year between 1949 and 1962. Uh, also then, in order to interpret beta r here as the causal impact of the reform, we have to invoke the so-called parallel trend assumption. This means that we have to assume that any changes uh, in municipality-specific factors should not be correlated with the timing of the reform. And in order to reduce uh, the risk of violating this assumption, we include also among the rest of uh, municipality cluster birth trends and also a set of uh, variables intended to measure changes in demographics and, uh, and, and socio-economic uh, development at the municipality level. Finally, we also, to, to, in, order to con in order to control for population certification, we include also the first 10 principal components of the genetic related matrix. Uh, a quick word also on the second equation, which is uh, an additive model, an interaction model, and the main focus here is on the coefficient beta sub rs, which is the effect of the interaction between the reform and the, and the polygenic score. And it would tell us whether the reform impact increases or decreases as a function of the polygenic score. Let's start here by looking at some results from quantile regressions, separately for males in the upper graph and females in the lower graph. And I've also included, for, for reference, the OLS, uh, average OLS effect for both of these subsamples. What we can see here directly is that the reform seems to have had different impact across the sexes. So for the males, to start with, most of the action is going on at the bottom end of the distribution. So we have significant and positive reform effects uh, ranging from uh, the, the bottom end up until and including approximately the 20th percentile. So the reform seems to have forced some, probably the low ability individuals, as we'll see in the next slide, to complete two more extra years of education. For the females, we have the same kind of compression effect at the bottom end of uh, the di distribution, but not as pronounced. But more importantly, we also have ripple effects at higher levels of the uh, uh, education distribution positive and significant effects up until almost the 50th percentile of the median. And the interesting question now is if this particular pattern is related to ability, or in our case, the polyonic score. And we can uh, test this in a simple way by just uh, dividing up the sample between low and high ability individuals. First one, only for males here. So we have High ability may, low ability males, sorry, in the upper graph, with a, be, with a below median uh, polygenic score, and high ability males in the lower graph. And what we can see here is that this compression effect of the uh, reform uh, is mostly something that happens among the low ability males. More interesting is uh, the results for the females. We can, uh, once again, we can see that there is a compression effect. We have strong positive effects of the reform at the lower end of the education distribution among the low uh, ability females, whereas among the higher ability females, we have ripple effects higher up uh, in the education distribution. And these results are consistent with a signaling story. Lastly, I also want to show some results from regression models. Uh, here we have results using four different outcomes. First outcome is just years of schooling. The second outcome, second column, is a dummy for completing at least nine years of schooling, which in the pre-reform system was the first non-compulsive degree, uh, a junior high school degree. And in the post-reform system, it's just a new minimum level of schooling. The third column is a dummy for uh, completing at least 12 years of education, which is equal to a theoretical high school degree. And the last column, a dummy for completing 15 years of schooling, approximately equal to, uh, to completing a college degree. 
And here we have results from both additive and uh, additive models and a non-additive model. So the first two rows are from an additive model, and the third row is from a separate interaction model, and we only provide here the interaction estimate. First, a quick look at the additive results. So we can see that there is an average effect of the reform amounting to 0.45, approximately, 0.45 years of schooling uh, among the females here. And this is very much in line with previous studies using this reform. Uh, there is also uh, one very expected effect in the second column, such that the reform led to an increase in the probability of completing nine years of schooling by almost 12 percentage points. And this is sort of a mechanical effect since nine years of schooling after reform was the minimum level of schooling. However, there are no uh, average effects at higher levels of the distribution, uh, education distribution for high school and college. And as, as uh, expected, we can see strong and positive effects of the polygenic score also for all four different outcomes here. Turning instead to the interaction estimates in the first column, uh, we have a positive interaction implying that the reform effect on years of schooling is stronger for high ability females or females scoring higher on the PDS. However, this interaction is not significant. In the second and third columns, we have some more interesting and significant results. First, the second column, a negative interaction for completing nine years of schooling, which just tells us that uh, the positive effect of the reform is strongest among the low ability females and decreases with the ability zone. And this is just what we saw in the previous uh, uh, graphs using um, uh, quantile regressions. And in the third column we have uh, the results for completing high school. We have a positive interaction and once again means that um, uh, the reform effect on completing high school is stronger for high ability females. So one more time this is consistent with a, uh, with a single story where we have ripple effect higher up in the ability distribution uh, as a consequence of the reform. Last result slide is for income. Uh, once again, I, I will concentrate on females because it's in the female sample we have the most interesting results. We have restricted the sample here to females between 25 and 55 years of age. Uh, and the, these are also results from panel regressions since we have multiple observations for each individual here. Uh, and uh, columns two, three, and four is just us dividing the sample in, uh, up into groups that we can refer to as, as early career, mid career, and late career incomes. So we have a weak uh, effect of, uh, of the reform on average effect of the reform, such that the reform increased income by 0.03 log points. There's also a positive and significant uh, effect of the polygenic score on income in the additive models. And in the interaction models, we, have, we find a positive and significant interaction effect, meaning that the effect of reform, the positive effect of reform is stronger among high ability females. So to conclude, what we find here in, in these results is, at least for the female samples, estimates that are consistent with a signaling story. So we have a reform that forces low ability individuals to get somewhat more education. Uh, at the same time, this, uh, uh, this incentivizes the high, uh, higher ability uh, individuals to get even more education, which also has a payoff for them in terms of higher incomes. So I should also point out here that this is very much work in progress. And the next step for us is to use a new and hopefully more precise polygenic score based on the ongoing EA3 work. And we are also in the process of obtaining more data from Statistics Sweden. And using this data, we will be able to use a slightly larger sample in our models. And this data will also contain information about the parents, siblings, and children to the genotyped individuals. And these relatives won't be genotyped, but anyway, they will enable us to test for some well, uh, above all, intergenerational effects of this reform. And the data will also contain several new and potentially very interesting outcomes, such as health measures, uh, criminal behavior, participation, and much more. 
Thank you very much for your attention. Hi, uh, my name is Patrick Turley. Um, let me just pull this up, full screen. OK, great. So um, I'm going to show some work that's um, kind of similar in type to the work that we just, um, we just saw. It's joint work with Silvia Barcelos and uh, Leander Carvalho. Um, and we're going to look at the, the genetic heterogeneity impact of education on, on health instead of socio socioeconomic outcomes. Um, so one of the reasons that I, I, I think this work, uh, that, you know, I think this work is kind of exciting um, is first it, it's uh, relevant for an interesting puzzle in the literature, which I'll talk about. Um, similar to the work that Sven just talked about, it also, um, the, the environmental shock is, is plausibly exogenous, and so that helps with the interpretation of the results that uh, we're going to see. Um, it's also estimated in a very large sample size, which is um, going to be very important as I show you. Um, a along with, I think, probably many of the people in this room, the, the, the full results, we're, we're waiting on the full release of the UK Biobank before we're well powered to actually say all the things that I'd like to say about these results. Um, but I, I'll show you some, some you know, suggestive preliminary results. Um, but primarily, I'd like to comment on, uh, on G by E effect sizes and, and why it's reasonable that you know, we may find something and, and hopefully give people something to think about as they're, as they're thinking about their own G by E research in the future. Um, so just as an introduction, you know, a lot of people think that education is an important determinant of health um, that shows up in just observational studies. Um, you know, just when you look at the relationship between health and education, of course, that's not necessarily causal. However, a, a standard approach to try to get at this causal relationship is to use compulsory schooling laws, again, like, like Sven introduced really well. Um, one of the, the confusing things about looking at the effect of education on health using compulsory schooling laws is that there's a lot of variation in, in these estimates where some, you know, one group will find some large effect and then another paper will find no effect at all. Um, and even looking at the same interventions, different papers will find, um, you know, different magnitudes and, um, of the effect size. Um, in some preliminary work that I'm, I'm also doing with Sylvia and Leandro, um, we're able to find some evidence that there is a large amount of, of heterogeneity in the response. So if one person, you give them additional education, the impact on their health may be very different than the impact on a different person. Um, and so the point of our research here is, um, how does this causal effect of education that we're interested in and that we can estimate using compulsory schooling laws um, how does it vary by genotype? Are we able to identify people who are likely to react more strongly um, to, to additional education? Um, and so the instrument that we're going to use specifically is the 1972 raising of school leaving age in the UK. Um, so, so in 1972, the UK raised the age at which you could drop out of school from 15 to 16. And so this means that students who were born just with a day apart from each other just before the reform was enacted and just after, um, who should have been you know, observationally identical, this one group born after the reform got a, uh, an extra year or got additional schooling than, than the group before. And so we can um, compare the health outcomes of these groups just to give you a sense of the magnitude of this reform. Um, in the years, so this is uh, on the y-axis, we have the fraction staying in, in school till at least age 16. Um, and the x-axis is the year of birth, where zero corresponds to the, the year of the reform. And so we see before the reform happened, you know, roughly 20% 20, 20 or so were dropping out at age 15. Um, and then, of course, um, after the reform, nearly everyone stayed after that. Um, it's not 100% because there was, uh, well, I don't want to go into those details, but, but we see it's roughly a 15 percentage point increase in the fraction of students staying in school until age 16. Um, so that's, that's pretty substantial. And it lends itself well to just a, a, a regression discontinuity design to understand the impact of education on health. And so this is going to look pretty familiar, I think, to people who've seen um, RD work. And so this is the, the top equation that we have here is, is what we'd like to know. So why is some outcome? And we want to know the impact of education on that outcome. Um, of course, there may be uh, birth, birth year trends. And so we're going to control for those. And there's also going to be a number of other controls that we can include. 
The way that this uh, specification is different than a standard RD is normally we just put a single coefficient on this education variable. Whereas I'm going to have a, a functional form that will allow the effect of education to vary by a person's genotype. Um, of course, we can't estimate this directly. Um, but because we have this, this nice reform that have, gives an exogenous shift in educational attainment, we can use the, the ROSL as an instrument um, for education. Um, I just have some technical details at the bottom. We're going to estimate this with a triangle kernel and quadratic friends and a 10-year bandwidth of data. Um, in, when we just looked at the average effects and not the heterogeneous effects, our results seem to be pretty robust to you know, doing different things like a linear trends and tighter bandwidths and stuff. We've not had um, the opportunity to uh, extensively test the robustness of, of the results I'm going to show you today. Um, but uh, maybe we'll, we'll hopefully have those going forward. Um, so then going to this function of, of the, the genotype. So there's a, there's a number of, you know, you could do a bunch of different functions of your genotype to, to measure the effect of, of education on your health. I'm just going to do a very simple linear function. Um, rather than looking at individual SNPs, I'm going to use these polygenic scores that we're talking about today and that we're all excited about. And so here we have um, S, which is a vector of polygenic scores. Um, in order to account for possible stratification in these scores, I'm also going to have a, a set of principal components. Um, specifically for our scores, we're going to have a, a, a BMI score based on the Locke et al. 2015 and uh, the EA score from the Ocbe et al. paper last year. Um, great. So we're going to estimate this using the UK Biobank. Um, this is an exciting data set that I'm sure we all know about. We have almost half a million people um, who recruited, uh, aged between 40 and 69, recruited several years ago. What's nice about this is the, the ages of the people recruited by the Biobank is just right exactly the right interval that we would need to study the 72 Rosla. So that was just a uh, you know, very convenient thing for us. Um, this data set is very rich. There's a, you know, a ton of, they, they completed a survey, they provided biological samples, and their data is linked to administrative health records. So it's really rich for looking at health. Um, we're going to limit our sample just to those who were born in England, Scotland, and Wales, because those are the people who are likely affected by the reform. Um, and then once we have all these restrictions and we look at people within some window of the reform, we still have um, 268,000 people. Um, and so, really big sample size. With the current release of the data, we only have genetic data on a quarter of them. And so these interaction effects, um, you know, you should think of, of, of having been estimated in, you know, in a number a quarter of this 200,000, but we'll eventually be able to do it in all, you know, 270,000 people. Um, so I just explained how we have these really rich health outcomes. Um, a problem that we have, you know, and there's so many of them that, you know, we could look at all of them, but there's enormous multiple testing problems. Um, and so we wanted to think of a way to try to restrict the outcomes that we're looking at um, so that we don't have to worry about multiple testing. Um, what we've done is we've just gone through the available uh, variables that we had. We looked for available, uh, variables that were objective measures, so we don't use any self-reported health measures. Um, and, and we picked ones that we thought were plausibly linked um, to education. So that was just sort of a, a subjective um, assessment that we made before actually doing the analysis. Um, and then we took these variables and we grouped them into different categories um, and combined these measures. So, so for example, um, uh, one grouping is the anthropometric measures, and so that includes things like BMI, waist-hip ratio, they have uh, measures of body fat percentage. Um, there's a spirometry measure um, where they measure lung health, and so there's a bunch of different measures that we combine there as a single lung health measure. Um, and then we have measures of blood pressure. Um, in addition to this, we just took these three index measures of health and we combined them into a, just a general health measure. And to give you a sense of how these relate, um, each of these first three indexes that we um, that we generated um, have a, a pairwise correlation of, of about 0.2. Um, since the general health measure is a function of, of the first three, the, the correlation of, of those is, is about 0.7. Um, so the correlation between like health and blood pressure. 
Um, and so I'm going to show you some, some preliminary results. And, and again, given that we only have data on a quarter of the sample, I'm, I'm going to be very uh, non-committal about these. Um, but, but I did want to I did want to show you at least what we have, and then, and then hopefully we'll have uh, better results that I think are more reliable when the full data come in. Um, one thing that we're actually very well powered to test, though, is just our first stage. And so on the on the left hand side. This is the, the, the y-axis is the change in the fraction of people leaving school at age 16. Um, and, and on the x-axis is the value of the polygenic score. And so this, the slope here is the implied curve based on the coefficient estimates. But the dotted line there is just the average effect. So like I said, it's, it's roughly 15%. You could see it from the previous scatter plot I showed you. Um, but based on the coefficients on the interactions, you see that there's substantial uh, treatment heterogeneity. And so, so, for example, look at the EA score. It's very, very steep, which means that people who have a very high EA score had a very small treatment. And that's because if you had a high EA score, you were very unlikely to drop out of school at age 15 beforehand. And so after the reform, when everyone was required to stay, um, you know, there were just not as many people affected. And so we should think about these results also. Not only is there a difference maybe in the treatment effect, but some of these groups were also differently treated. Uh, the BMI score goes the opposite direction, which means that people who are at higher risk of, of obesity based on their score uh, were more likely to have dropped out of school at age 15 before the reform. Um, so again, these are, these are the results that, that I have currently. The, the coefficients here are, um, are the ones about the interaction. You can see there's, there's not much very strong there. We do have like one thing that has, you know, is significant at 5%. I don't even trust that very much. I, I think we'll probably go away. Um, one, one result that I'm a little bit excited about, and, and even, though, even though it's not very significant, I, I like it because um, we've tested it for the robustness uh, more extensively than the other variables. But we see that there's this negative slope on, the, uh, on our anthropometric index. So this is like the, the BMI thing. Um, compared to um, just a, a positive effect up here. So, so we've oriented these so a positive number means an improvement in health. And so on average, we see a, uh, you know, an, an increase in, in health related to things like BMI um, when you get more education. Um, but that's attenuated by people um, if, if you have a high BMI score. And so if you're at a high risk, if, if we wanted to take these estimates you know, literally and say, yeah, this, this is real, what this suggests is that a person who has a, a high risk for, for uh, obesity if you gave them an additional year of schooling at age 15, um, that that person would have a hard time or be less likely to, to reduce their, their BMI later in life. Whereas someone who has a, a low risk of BMI, um, if you give them an additional year of school, they're uh, much more likely to be reducing their BMI due to that additional year. But again, I don't want to focus on these too much. Um, we, need to, we need to wait for the full data before we, we really trust them. Um, so just finally, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, power in general for these G by E studies. And so, you know, like I said, our sample size is not really big enough for me to, to really be confident in, in the results that I just showed you. Um, however, if we just look at them, it, it does allow us to, to think about what are the plausible effect sizes in G by E studies. Um, there's, there is enormous risk in performing underpowered analyses, as we know. Um, because if you're underpowered, and um, there's first going to be a lot higher false discovery rate, um, and and if you do find something, your result is going to intend to be inflated away from zero. So so your your result is more likely to be false, and and also it's going to overstate the actual effect. And so we want to be careful when we do any of these G by E studies to make sure we're well powered going into it. Um, of course, the power depends on the anticipated effect of the interaction. So the question is, what's, what are plausible magnitudes for G by E effects? And so this is a slide that Dan actually um, put together and I stole from him. Um, it's based on work of a lot of people who are present. So uh, thank you for, for letting me borrow it um, for, this, uh, just for this presentation. And so the, the, the interesting column is this far right to you guys um, column, which gives the R squared of the G by E term. Um, for, for these different studies. Uh, what I wanted to highlight, one, one point I wanted to highlight is that you can see on average that these G by E scores look like they're maybe on the order of, of you know, 0 0.1, 0 0.2. Um, some of these studies are correlational studies. They're looking at the, the G by E of, of just the correlation. The two that are 
causal relationships are, are this one here. This is actually the results that Sven presented. And so Jonathan, Beauchamp, um, Isu, and Kevin, um, and Sven all worked on. So you see that tends to be much smaller. It's also uh, along the lines of kind of what we predict um, the R squared is in, in our interaction. And the reason I want to point those out, because those are, those are the two studies in this list that are based on um, well-identified um, uh, well estimates. And so this is, if, if you're doing uh, G by E work with, with instruments and you want to talk about um, you know, the G by E effect with, with exogenous variation in E, it, just based on a small, small sample, obviously, of things, it looks like those effects tend to be much smaller, an order of magnitude smaller. Um, so the reason this is relevant for power is here's, here's, here's the power of finding the effect at, at 5% given the different R squared levels. Um, and then the, the right three columns is 5% uh, minus 3 to account for the potential um, uh, multiple testing correction you want to do if you have an interaction in there. And so we can see that you know, at, at about 10,000 individuals, if you're doing G by E, um, you know, you're, you have you're pretty well powered if you have something that is, is about 0.1, which is what we're seeing in a lot of these correlational G by E studies. Um, if you wanted to do something where, where you know, if, if your effect sizes are comparable to what we're seeing in the UK or that Sven was seeing in, uh, in Sweden, you know, this, this is the relevant columns. And, and you, it, it's hard to start seeing things until you have these really large sample sizes. You're, you're not very well powered until you get to sample sizes on the order of 100,000 people. And so, um, so that's, that's a, I think, an important point to keep in mind. Um, so just to, to kind of in summary of, of the points that, I, that I've been making, if, if, you, if you'd like to do G by E studies, I think you know, it's important that you have sufficiently large samples, um, as large as you know, 10,000 and maybe even 100,000 individuals, depending on what you anticipate the, the effect to be. Um, and so, uh, you know, so we should, we should think of that as we're, as we're doing this research and as we're consuming this research. Um, it looks as if in, in the UK Biobank, once we have the, the full data, um, we'll be entering that range in the current sample size where we, um, own, you know, I think that we had 200,000 individuals, but only a quarter of them are genotypes. So we're not very well powered at this point, but we should be uh, once we have the full data. So we're, we're looking forward, like everyone here, I'm sure, to having the complete data to, to get the final results on this project. Uh, that's, that's what I have. Thank you. Environmental changes that are more credibly exogenous also tend to be things that, that just have smaller effects as well, right? That you know, moving the like, minimum schooling age from 15 to 16 is something that's just, has a far smaller effect than the kind of SES variables, say, that, that, that you might look at. But you have certainly have endogeneity problems that you're concerned about, but you shouldn't expect. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, so he was just bringing up the point that, the, I mean, the reason that you may expect the, the G by E with exogenous shifts in the environment to be smaller is because these exogenous shifts that we find represent only a small fraction of the, um, you know, these small, small effects. So just moving from 15 to 16 is not going to explain a lot of changes in health versus, um, you know, the variation in education throughout the whole distribution. But um, I saw a hand in the back. Oh, here, yes. So, um, so I think it's a very interesting conversation. I mean, I think one thing you really have to think about is you go by about, you know, people you go through with wonderful data. Wonderful data, it's a 5% response rate. Yeah. It's the most extraordinarily selective sample mm -hmm. you can get. I'm probably the only person here who's in Biobank. When I sat in the screening clinic, I just met all the senior faculty at the university. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, because you, I mean, what you've got is you've got a lecture and an appointment there. And uh, that was that's what you had to turn up. Uh, you know, most people have real jobs, and like us, can't just go and, can't just go and uh, do that. So it's extraordinarily selective. The second thing is that selection is very is strongly driven by the factors you're looking at. Yeah. So for example, if you're looking at polygenic score for education, we have a study called ALSFAT, where we've got core blood on 99% of them. They have no chance of not responding. 
We can then develop the education score. It hugely predicts the follow-up over the next 25 years. And with that, you get strong collider biases because you are, you, are, you, are, you are basically stratifying on an extraordinarily uh, acute thing, which is 5% response rate. So any two things which lead to people turning up become automatically negatively correlated. Yeah. That is why you see papers coming from Biobank saying that, uh, implausibly, that uh, you know, larks, you know, people who like staying up late, get better educational attainment. Because people get up in the appointments in the morning, people get up in the morning, turn up, people more educated turn up, you get an inverse correlation. So this idea, so I'm, I'm extremely worried about everyone waiting for this biobank data to arrive and start turning stuff out because a whole chunk of it is going to be nonsense. Mm -hmm. With that level of response rate and not understanding the problems of dealing with a 5% uh, selected uh, sample. The second point, uh, on, you, showed this, you showed this interaction with BMI, you know, with education score and BMI. So we published, you know, relatively recently, we published, because we got so fed up with people publishing these interactions with the BMI polygenic score, walking out the New England Journal of Medicine saying, get yeah, more fatty food, then you go to BMI score, so it's more strongly related to BMI, which should target fatty food. Another one came out saying, if you watch too much TV, the same is the case. Another one said, if you eat salty food, it's true. Another one came out saying, if you don't do much exercise, it's true. So we just showed that in UK Biobank, if you do any association method, show strong inverse associations. The even better off, show a smaller effect of BMI score. So we use the negative control of putting on sunscreen. The sunscreen is expensive. You know, poorer folk don't use much sunscreen. And the same, by the same logic as your conclusion, the thing is if you, if you, if you want not to get a uh, high BMI with your score, put on sunscreen. It shows exactly the same So yeah, so I mean, <laughs> you've said a lot of different things. And so I'm, I'm going to try to just say really quickly respond to, to some of them at least. I, I, the, the selection is, is very important, um, and, and you should think about how that's going to uh, affect the results. One of the reasons that I'm a little bit less concerned about it in this particular case relative to maybe some other settings is that we're being identified off of variation in between the 15th and 16th year of educational attainment. And so if there's all sorts of selection that is, is hanging out up and like, you know, there's a lot more college graduates or, or things like that in the data, as long as that selection doesn't vary across the, the birth year threshold, um, then it's all going to cancel out when you do the RD. Um, so, so, but it is, it is possible that there is selection based on getting that 16th year of education. Um, I find that uh, a little bit less plausible than the amount of selection you see just based on, on college, but it is true. Like, I'm not trying to say that it's definitely not a problem. Um, in terms of, sorry? It's testable. We've not, we've not tested it yet. Neil Davis has published that. As you know, Neil Davis has published all the stuff on the Roswell and Biobank. He put his name up on the thing. Yeah. And Neil's paper, so we just looked at the education score, the project score, and showed that that did not change with it was birth year. So, 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 so it's not that you couldn't see differential selection. But I mean, it's one of the things which the project scores are actually really useful for and, and aren't being useful because everyone's desperate to get interactions and stuff which sounds very, uh, you know, really exciting, is you can actually use them to test, to test selection. That's actually very powerful. It's very useful. Yeah, no, exactly. And so we've done a lot of those tests as well, which is, again, because, because it doesn't look like there's differential selection, you know, we're, we're maybe okay in this particular case. Um, I forget all the other things that you said. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, this is really interesting. Um, I was just wondering, I, the, natu the natural next step seems to be to actually formally estimate the two-stage instrumental variable analysis, right? And so, if, if, if I'm correct, you'd have to enter the interaction in both stages, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so the numbers that I showed were, were actually the IV estimates. But they were. Yeah, but like, like I said, they're, they're, they're really underpowered. I think, um, I don't know, we'll see uh, what, so, what it looks yeah, like. I mean, where I was going is that when you enter in both stages, then they're potentially multiplying together so they're even smaller. Right, so perhaps you, so maybe given that what it turns out you, had, you, you showed us was the effect size for the the instrumental variable estimate. Maybe, yeah. maybe if you just did, maybe each stage would have better power on its own. If you just looked at, say that one more time, sorry? Right, so the IV estimate, you first have to do 
education and reform, and then you have to do this predicted score. Yeah. The predicted score is predicting uh, health outcomes, right? And so if you're, and if you're interested in heterogeneity, you have to look at it in both steps. Mm -hmm. And so then you're I mean, in practice, one interaction into the next interaction analysis. And so that's going to dilute power, but maybe for the separate stages. Right, so maybe rather than do it as an instrumental variable analysis, just look at the reform of health I think in practice the careful way to do it would just be to, you know, you have your first stage with all of these before after indicators yeah. and then um, and you use any variable that has the before after as an instrument for the variable um, that has an, has an education right. interaction with it. Um, I, you know, and that seems to be like the, the clean, easy way. I mean, I, I'd worry about what sort of funny assumptions you'd introduce by, by doing just a standard kind of multi-instrument IV. Uh, but no, that's, um, I'd have to think about that a little more. Mm -hmm. uh, yes? Oh, sorry. Uh, we have all people calling, and Sven's just says, I'm just, <laughs> um, go ahead first. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, so, so to be very open and frank about it, so what we have here, uh, as I said before, these are very preliminary results. Mm -hmm. And what we started with was, we didn't start with the theory. We started with the empirical results. We had a nice way of uh, identifying uh, G by E effect. And now we need one way of selling these results to uh, an economist public. Uh, had we written this for a sociologist or for a political uh, scientists or someone else, we would not have framed this using human capital uh, hypothesis and sorting uh, the sorting model. So we're struggling a little bit with that, and, and of course we're, we're happy to, to to every kind of suggestion we, we, we can have for that. But, uh, as for, I think that was your second question uh, on on uh, the, the the lack of, of significant effects higher up in the education distribution. So there, there it's. It's a little bit more than two spikes. I think there are like significant effects between like the 20th percentile and, and up until the median. But they are, I mean, as also Patrick pointed out, we have a quite small sample, 6,000. 
I shouldn't have let, permitted you to use our souls. Because, yeah. <laughs> so, so anyway, so, so of course we are not super well powered. And we know that uh, that is a problem. Uh, so, so that's also well. We we're hoping a little bit for first of all the new score and some new data, so we get at least slightly more well powered to do this analysis. As for the first question, I'm not sure I remember it actually now. Uh, so, so that was about not being a reform, but the, being a dis. Reform. Yeah. 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 And we're just uh, testing for one versus the other, so that's not, we're not taking yeah, any. So that theory you proposed here suggests we're not proposing a theory. the reform is purely <laughs> generally negative, no. or that we lost this to all of the kids involved. Uh, we pretty, no, pretty much no, just, we, we use the theory to, 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 to interpret the results. That's not what the theory says at all. Mm -hmm. Now, the theory may no. be beneficial, it, it reduces the cost of time, and then might actually switch people to, uh, to change their optimum. It doesn't necessarily lead to only forcing. My, without the reform, I get to do seven years of schooling and out. Now I have to do nine years of schooling. If I were optimizing at seven, nine is definitely generating that we're lost to. Okay. The, I, think the, the, I think the artists are trying to, to distinguish between these two key theories, which and you can have this interpretation. You say <laughs> this theory doesn't fit your story. I have a question about the rationale of using these polygenic scores in interaction models. Since the polygenic score is a weighted composite of individual SNPs, it seems to me implicitly you're, you're assuming that there's so much baby in the interaction across the SNPs. What's more, they're weighted by the marginal effects to manage certain types of interaction models. I, I, I suppose that the sample size requirements to make it more adaptive might be just overwhelming, but have you thought through it? It, it seems odd to me to, to suggest that these scores generated based on the main effects would be the right way to go for interactions, but maybe I'm wrong. No, no, that's definitely true, and that's a concern, right? Like, optimally, if we had, like, all of the data in the whole world, uh, what we do is we do, like, a, a, a GWAS of, um, you know, the RD. We do, like, an, we do an RD GWAS, right? Um, we obviously can't do that. Um, the degree to which the polygenic score that we're using is not the right score does well, would attenuate any you know anything that we find. It might not even be a score you want. That's maybe more. Well, I mean, I guess it depends on what you mean. What what what, what we're trying to accomplish, right? Like it, it's um, if if our you know so so in, in my head, one of the interesting things of, about the results is is not that. I want to throw an interpretation on on the score, but I think it's really interesting. Or you know, let's say that we well even in the first okay, let's say we find something. I would think it's very interesting that we're able to identify using a polygenic score, even an imperfect polygenic score, which people um, are most strongly affected by the reform, right? Um, and and it could be that you do you would do a lot better if you had the right score. Um, but even with the wrong score, it looks like um, we're finding some of these, these interactions potentially, right? And so, but no, it's a, it, it is a good point. Um, if, if we had a lot more data, we could do something a little better and it would, it would uh, inflate the, the slope on our, on our scores. But if we find something without, I don't think it's, uh, it, it just means it's like an attenuated <coughs> estimate of, of the right thing. Can I just say something about the way I think about the polygenic score is it's a, it's a measure of the additive genetic factor. So I mean, it's, it's a measurement error, but, but so these G by E studies are looking at the interaction with the additive genetic factor. It just seems risky to, to, to get an additive genetic It seems risky to, to draw. I, I, I think it's very interesting, so don't get me wrong. 
but it seems risky to therefore draw general conclusions, which you're not doing, about the nature of gene buggy interaction. Because you're, you're looking at it in a very narrow and kind of very limited way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think at, at most at this point, all we can talk about is like it's, I mean, the score is a predictor. We're talking about predicting the causal effect of education. Um, and, and you have to be very careful about taking it a, a lot further than that. This is because the Swedish twins are genotyped. So that, that, that's pretty much the only reason. So uh, we also tested some sensitive analysis to skip one thing in each pair just to, look, uh, to see that the results are about to this and they are, but then of course we get uh, slightly smaller sample sizes. Well. No more questions? I don't know how sensitive to, to this area, but, but it, it's a little worrying that, that there's no background theory as to what you're going to expect in your gene type and interaction. I mean, to sort of constrain your, your possibilities. And, and another thing was, I'm old enough that we never used to report that at 10% level of significance. Okay? <laughs> so, what happened? <laughs> in these fields. I mean, it's not like physics. I think they want like five standard errors away before they even consider uh, reporting something. And so there just is this worry that if everyone is out there looking, and if there's a bias towards finding gene environment interactions, that there could be a lot of very bad stuff. That's a, that's, and that's a really good right. point. And so like under normal circumstances, I, I obviously wouldn't try to play out 10% p-values. Um, you know, I, I, I show them because, I mean, things that have a p-value of 10% in its current data, if the betas stayed the same, then, um, you know, those are things that would have p-values of, like, 0.05 in the, you know, when the next wave of data comes out. So that's the only reason that I, that I marked them at all here. Um, but, uh, I mean, I think Dan is, is doing some work thinking about whether even 0.05 is, is maybe too, uh, too liberal, and we, we should be, reporting, um, like calling things significant once they're at key values substantially less than that, 0.005 or, um, and, and I think that's probably a, a reasonable concern, especially given like the replicability crisis that, that seems to be in a lot of social sciences, right? If, if um, we, we, we all should be very careful whenever we do this G by E sorts of things, you know, it, when there's kind of a new tool, there's a big rush to use them and, and if we're underpowered and our p-value threshold is not not high enough, we're just going to have a, a ridiculous amount of false discoveries showing up. And so, you know, word of, word of caution, uh, just generally, that I think we're all sort of aware of, but, yeah. I have a related point to this one, which is, you know, we're always worried about multiple hypothesis testing, and it seems like in these GYE studies, that's even more of a concern because there's lots of possible interactions, so there's kind of, especially when you start breaking down by compound. So it seems like, um, Maybe one of the um, standards that we should think about as a as a field is, is you know, we should probably think about pre-registration in general, but especially for GYE as a type study, it seems like it might be uh, valuable. Just very briefly, uh, in addition to pre-registration, I would implore everyone to publish all of the things. I mean, don't yeah. not submit something because the stupid alpha that, you know, was, was not what you hoped. I mean, I think a large part of the problem is we don't even know what the problem is because none of the literature is out there. You know, I, I can tell you that there is stuff that NIH has supported that we wouldn't have supported had there been a literature out there telling us at the beginning it was futile. Mm -hmm. All right? Now, we don't do a great job of getting you there right now, but, you know, if there's anything that anything to be made here. It's actually making sure that we've got pre-registered studies and that therefore the literature is really reflecting what we actually would find in the world. Mm -hmm. Because I, I just can't put it hard enough. You know, it's like you did the study, you, you did it this way, you designed it that way, we got something that wasn't, you know, in, the editor didn't like it, and didn't get published. Somebody else could look at that and say, well, yeah, that didn't work, but wait a minute, they were scoring health this way, that makes no sense. 
and that you give them the idea that would make more sense. I mean, the data are what they are. You know, the procedures you got them are what they are. You had your hypotheses, you gave them your best shot. You need to come up with a situation where that's good enough. Otherwise, I think it's always going to become too efficient, and it's not going to be good. You guys actually have a great opportunity. Exactly what you're <laughs> <laughs> I mean, our plan is to do what I showed you. So if you see something else, you can call me yeah. on it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thanks for lunch. Yeah, it's okay. It's time for lunch. Um, everyone, please serve yourselves in the back. Have a seat outside. If you have dietary restrictions, I'll be standing back there to let you know if something's gluten-free, dairy-free, or vegetarian. <laughs>